Hello everyone, and welcome back to Frankenstein Friday. So last week we read two chapters of Frankenstein, in which Frankenstein himself was looking for a place to set up and establish his laboratory, so that he could commence creating a new creature, a companion for his former creature, well, his still in existence creature, but his other creature. So he found a small little broken down cottage type of place uh, in the British Isles, and that is where we are going to meet him again today to see how he commences on his labors. So let's meet up with Frankenstein in his laboratory as we begin chapter number 20. I sat one evening in my laboratory. The sun had set, and the moon was just rising from the sea. I had not sufficient light for my employment, and I remained idle, in a pause of consideration of whether I should leave my labor for the night, or hasten its conclusion by an unremitting attention to it. As I sat, a train of reflection occurred to me, which led me to consider the effects of what I was now doing. Three years before, I was engaged in the same manner, and had created a fiend whose unparalleled barbarity had desolated my heart, had filled it forever with the bitterest remorse. I was now about to form another being, of whose dispositions I was alike ignorant. She might become ten thousand times more malignant than her mate, and delight, for its own sake, in murder and wretchedness. He had sworn to quit the neighborhood of man, and hide himself in deserts, but she had not. And she, who in all probability was to become a thinking and reasoning animal, might refuse to comply with a compact made before her creation. They might even hate each other. The creature who already lived loathed his own deformity, and might he not conceive a greater abhorrence for it when it became before his eyes in a female form? She also might turn with disgust from him to the superior beauty of humans. She might quit him, and he be again alone, exasperated by the fresh provocation of being deserted by one of his own species. Even if they were to leave Europe, and inhabit the deserts of the New World, yet one of the first results of those sympathies for which the demon thirsted would be children, and a race of devils would be propagated upon the earth who might make the very existence of the species of man a condition precarious and full of terror. Had I right, for my own benefit, to inflict this curse upon everlasting generations? I had before been moved by the sophisms of the being I had created. I had been struck senseless by his fiendish threats. But now, for the first time, the wickedness of my promise burst upon me. I shuddered to think that future ages might curse me as their pest, whose selfishness had not hesitated to buy its own peace at the price, perhaps, of the existence of the whole human race. I trembled, and my heart failed within me, when, on looking up, I saw, by the light of the moon, the demon at the casement. A ghastly grin wrinkled his lips as he gazed on me, where I sat fulfilling the task which he had allotted me. Yes, he had followed me in my travels. He had loitered in forests, hid himself in caves, or taken refuge in wide and desert heaths. And he now came to mark my progress and claim the fulfillment of my promise. As I looked on him, his countenance expressed the utmost extent of malice and treachery. I thought with a sensation of madness on my promise of creating another like to him, and, trembling with passion, tore to pieces the thing on which I was engaged. The wretch saw me destroy the creature on whose future existence he depended for happiness, and, with a howl of devilish despair and revenge, withdrew. I left the room, and, locking the door, made a solemn vow in my own heart never to resume my labours. And then, with trembling steps, I sought my own apartment. I was alone. None were near to dissipate the gloom, and relieve me from the sickening oppression of the most terrible reveries. Several hours passed, and I remained near my window, gazing on the sea. It was almost motionless, for the winds were hushed, and all nature reposed under the eye of the quiet moon. A few fishing vessels alone specked the water, and, now and then, the gentle breeze wafted the sound of voices as the fishermen called to one another. 
I felt the silence, although I was hardly conscious of its extreme profundity, until my ear was suddenly arrested by the paddling of oars near the shore, and a person landed close to my house. In a few minutes after, I heard the creaking of my door, as if someone endeavoured to open it softly. I trembled from head to foot. I felt a presentiment of who it was, and wished to rouse one of the peasants who dwelt in a cottage not far from mine. But I was overcome by the sensation of helplessness, so often felt in frightful dreams, when you in vain endeavour to fly from an impending danger, and was rooted to the spot. Presently I heard the sound of footsteps along the passage. The door opened, and the wretch whom I dreaded appeared. Shutting the door, he approached me, and said, in a smothered voice, "'You have destroyed the work which you began. What is it that you intend? Do you dare to break your promise? I have endured toil and misery. I left Switzerland with you. I crept along the shores of the Rhine, among its willow islands, and over the summits of its hills.' I have dwelt many months in the heaths of England, and among the deserts of Scotland. I have endured incalculable fatigue, and cold, and hunger. Do you dare destroy my hopes? Be gone! I do break my promise. Never will I create another like yourself, equal in deformity and wickedness. Slave! I have before reasoned with you, but you have proved yourself unworthy of my condescension. Remember that I have power! You believe yourself miserable, but I can make you so wretched that the light of day will be hateful to you. You are my creator, but I am your master. Obey! The hour of my resolution is past, and the period of your power is arrived. Your threats cannot move me to do an act of wickedness, but they confirm in me a determination of not creating you a companion in vice. Shall I, in cool blood, set loose upon the earth a demon, whose delight is in death and wretchedness? Be gone! I am firm, and your words will only exasperate my rage. Saying thus, the monster saw my determination in my face, and gnashed his teeth in the impotence of anger. Shall each man, cried he, find a wife for his bosom, and each beast have his mate, and I be alone? I had feelings of affection, and they were requited by detestation and scorn. Man! You may hate, but beware! Your hours will pass in dread and misery, and soon the bolt will fall which must ravish from you your happiness forever. Are you to be happy while I grovel in the intensity of my wretchedness? You can blast my other passions, but revenge remains. Revenge, henceforth dearer than light or food! I may die, but first you, my tyrant and tormentor, shall curse the sun that gazes on your misery. Beware, for I am fearless and therefore powerful. I will watch with the wiliness of a snake that I may sting with its venom. Man, you shall repent of the injuries you conflict. Devil, cease, and do not poison the air with these sounds of malice. I have declared my resolution to you, and I am no coward to bend beneath words. Leave me. I am inexorable. It is well. I go. But, remember, I shall be with you on your wedding night. I started forward and exclaimed, Villain! Before you sign my death warrant, be sure that you are yourself safe. I would have seized him, but he eluded me and quitted the house with precipitation. In a few moments I saw him in his boat, which shot across the waters with an arrowy swiftness, and was soon lost amidst the waves. All was silent again, but his words rang in my ears. I burned with the rage to pursue the murderer of my peace and precipitate him into the ocean. I walked up and down my room hastily and perturbed, while my imagination conjured up a thousand images to torment and sting me. Why had I not followed him, and closed with him in mortal strife? But I had suffered him to depart, and he had directed his course towards the main island. I shuddered to think who might be the next victim's sacrifice to his insatiate revenge. And then I thought again of his words, I will be with you on your wedding night. That then was the period fixed for the fulfillment of my destiny. In that hour I should die, and at once satisfy and extinguish his malice. The prospect did not move me to fear, yet when I thought of my beloved Elizabeth, of her tears and endless sorrow, when she should find her lover so barbarously snatched from her, 
Tears, the first I had shed for many months, streamed from my eyes, and I resolved not to fall before my enemy without a bitter struggle. The night passed away, and the sun rose from the ocean. My feelings became calmer, if it may be called calmness, when the violence of rage sinks into the depths of despair. I left the house, the horrid scene of last night's contention, and walked on the beach of the sea, which I almost regarded as an insuperable barrier between me and my fellow creatures. Nay, a wish that should prove the fact stole across me. I desired that I might pass my life on that barren rock, wearily, it is true, but uninterrupted by any sudden shock of misery. If I returned, it was to be sacrificed, or to see those whom I most loved die under the grasp of a demon whom I myself had created. I walked about the isle like a restless spectre, separated from all it loved and miserable in the separation. When it became noon and the sun rose higher, I lay down on the grass and was overpowered by a deep sleep. I had been awake the whole of the preceding night. My nerves were agitated and my eyes inflamed by watching and misery. The sleep into which I now sank refreshed me, and, when I awoke, I again felt as if I belonged to a race of human beings like myself, and I began to reflect upon what had passed with greater composure. Yet still, the words of the fiend rang in my ears like a death knell. They appeared like a dream, yet distinct and oppressive as reality. The sun had far descended, and I still sat on the shore, satisfying my appetite, which had become ravenous, with an oaten cake when I saw a fishing boat land close to me, and one of the men brought me a packet. It contained letters from Geneva, and one from Clerval, entreating me to join him. He said that he was wearing away his time fruitlessly where he was, that letters from the friends he had formed in London desired his return to complete the negotiation they had entered into for his Indian enterprise. He could not any longer delay his departure, but, as his journey to London might be followed, even sooner than he now conjectured. By his longer voyage, he entreated me to bestow as much of my society on him as I could spare. He besought me, therefore, to leave my solitary isle, and to meet him at Perth, that we might proceed southwards together. This letter in a degree recalled me to life, and I determined to quit my island at the expiration of two days. Yet, before I departed, there was a task to perform, on which I shuddered to reflect. I must pack up my chemical instruments, and for that purpose I must enter the room which had been the scene of my odious work, and I must handle those utensils, the sight of which was sickening to me. The next morning, at daybreak, I summoned sufficient courage and unlocked the door of my laboratory. The remains of the half-finished creature whom I had destroyed, lay scattered on the floor, and I almost felt as if I had mangled the living flesh of a human being. I paused to collect myself, and then entered the chamber. With trembling hand I conveyed the instruments out of the room, but I reflected that I ought not to leave the relics of my work to excite the horror and suspicion of the peasants, and I accordingly put them into a basket with a great quantity of stones, and, laying them up, determined to throw them into the sea that very night and in the meantime I sat upon the beach, employed in cleaning and arranging my chemical apparatus. Nothing could be more complete than the alteration that had taken place in my feelings since the night of the appearance of the demon. I had before regarded my promise with a gloomy despair, as a thing that, with whatever consequences, must be fulfilled. But I now felt as if a film had been taken from before my eyes, and that I, for the first time, saw clearly. The idea of renewing my labors did not for one instant occur to me. The threat I had heard weighed on my thoughts, but I did not reflect that a voluntary act of mine could avert it. I had resolved in my own mind that to create another like the fiend I had first made would be an act of the basest and most atrocious selfishness, and I banished from my mind every thought that could lead to a different conclusion. Between two and three in the morning, the moon rose, and I then, putting my basket aboard a little skiff, sailed out about four miles from the shore. The scene was perfectly solitary. A few boats were returning towards land, but I sailed away from them. I felt as if I was about the, I was about the commission of a dreadful crime, 
and avoided, with shuddering anxiety, any encounter with my fellow creatures. At one time the moon, which had before been clear, was suddenly overspread by a thick cloud, and I took advantage of the moment of darkness, and cast my basket into the sea. I listened to the gurgling sound as it sank, and then sailed away from the spot. The sky became clouded, but the air was pure, although chilled by the northeast breeze that was then rising. But it refreshed me, and filled me with such agreeable sensations that I resolved to prolong my stay on the water and, fixing the rudder in a direct position, stretched myself at the bottom of the boat. Clouds hid the moon, everything was obscure, and I heard only the sound of the boat, as its keel cut through the waves. The murmur lulled me, and, in a short time, I slept soundly. I do not know how long I remained in this situation, but, when I awoke, I found that the sun had already mounted considerably. The wind was high, and the waves continually threatened the safety of my little skiff. I found that the wind was northeast, and must have driven me far from the course from which I had embarked. I endeavored to change my course, but quickly found that, if I again made the attempt, the boat would be instantly filled with water. Thus situated, my only resource was to drive before the wind. I confess that I felt a few sensations of terror. I had no compass with me, and was so slenderly acquainted with the geography of this part of the world that the sun was of little benefit to me. I might be driven into the wide Atlantic and feel all the tortures of starvation, or be swallowed up in the immeasurable waters that roared and buffeted around me. I had already been out many hours and felt the torment of a burning thirst, a prelude to my other sufferings. I looked on the heavens, which were covered by clouds that flew before the wind, only to be replaced by others. I looked upon the sea. It was to be my grave. Fiend! I exclaimed. Your task is already fulfilled! I thought of Elizabeth, of my father, and of Clerval, all left behind, on whom the monster might satisfy his sanguinary and merciless passions. This idea plunged me into a reverie, so despairing and frightful, that even now, when the scene is on the point of closing before me forever, I shudder to reflect on it. Some hours passed thus, but, by degrees, as the sun declined towards the horizon, the wind died away into a gentle breeze, and the sea became free from breakers. But these gave place to a heavy swell. I felt sick and hardly able to hold the rudder, when suddenly I saw a line of high land towards the south. Almost spent, as I was, by fatigue, and the dreadful suspense I endured for several hours, this sudden certainty of life rushed like a flood of warm joy to my heart, and tears gushed from my eyes. How mutable are our feelings, and how strange is that clinging love we have of life, even in the excess of misery! I constructed another sail with a part of my dress, and eagerly steered my course towards the land. It had a wild and rocky appearance, but, as I approached nearer, I easily perceived the traces of cultivation. I saw vessels near the shore, and found myself suddenly transported back to the neighborhood of civilized man. I carefully traced the windings of the land, and hailed a steeple which I at length saw issuing from behind a small promontory. As I was in a state of extreme debility, I resolved to sail directly towards the town, as a place where I could most easily procure nourishment. Fortunately, I had money with me. As I turned the promontory, I perceived a small, neat town, and a good harbour, which I entered, my heart bounding with joy at my unexpected escape. As I was occupied in fixing the boat and arranging the sails, several people crowded towards the spot. They seemed much surprised at my appearance, but, instead of offering me any assistance, whispered together with gestures that at any other time might have produced in me a slight sensation of alarm. As it was, I merely remarked that they spoke English, and I therefore addressed them in that language. "'My good friends,' said I, "'will you be so kind as to tell me the name of this town, and inform me where I am?' "'You will know that soon enough,' replied a man with a hoarse voice. "'Maybe you are come to a place that will not prove much to your taste, "'but you will not be consulted as to your quarters, I promise you.' "'I was exceedingly surprised on receiving so rude an answer from a stranger, "'and I was also disconcerted on perceiving the frowning and angry countenances of his companions. "'Why do you answer me so roughly?' I replied. "'Surely it is not the custom of Englishmen to receive strangers so inhospitably.' 
I don't know, said the man, what the custom of the English may be, but it is the custom of the Irish to hate villains. While this strange dialogue continued, I perceived the crowd rapidly increase. Their faces expressed a mixture of curiosity and anger, which annoyed, and, in some degree, alarmed me. I inquired the way to the inn, but no one replied. I then moved forward, and a murmuring sound arose from the crowd as they followed and surrounded me. When an ill-looking man approaching tapped me on the shoulder and said, Come, sir, you must follow me to Mr. Kerwin's to give an account of yourself. Who is Mr. Kerwin? Why am I to give an account of myself? Is this not a free country? Aye, sir, free enough for honest folks. Mr. Kerwin is a magistrate, and you are to give an account of the death of a gentleman who was found murdered here last night. This answer startled me, but I presently recovered myself. I was innocent. That could easily be proved. Accordingly, I found my conductor in silence, and was led to one of the best houses in the town. I was ready to sink from fatigue and hunger, but, being surrounded by a crowd, I thought it politic to rouse all my strength, that no physical debility might be construed into apprehension or conscious guilt. Little did I then expect the calamity that was in a few moments to overwhelm me, and extinguish in horror and despair all fear of ignominy or death. I must pause here, for it requires all my fortitude to recall the memory of the frightful events, events which I am about to relate, in proper detail, to my recollection. And so concludes chapter 20 of Frankenstein. So some really, really interesting points of conversation there. Right off the bat, we have Frankenstein engaging in the creation of the female creature, right? But then he reconsiders. He has a few thoughts. He goes, well... The, the most important of which being, well, if I create this creature, she is not bound by the same rules that the male creature accepted, right? The, the male creature telling Frankenstein that if he were to make a new female creature, the two of them would take off to somewhere in South America, basically just disappear completely and no more bother humankind. However, Frankenstein realized, wait a minute, the female creature never agreed to that. She would be brought into life just for that sole purpose. He would be creating life, which he now knows is, you know, real life. This creature is capable of thinking and speaking and learning and having emotions. And he would be creating that creature strictly for the purpose of satisfying his male creature. That is a really profound idea. It's, it's as if, you know, it's kind of like an arranged marriage scenario, but even worse, because not only does is she forced to marry this person before she's even born, but she has no, no say in the matter. She can't do anything else either. She has to uh, dedicate herself to a, a reclusive life. She won't be allowed to just integrate and even explore society because the creature who came before her already knows that they won't be able to integrate. So what a despairing situation that would be for the new creature. Very, very interesting thought. So, considering this, Frankenstein decides not to go through with the creation of the new creature and absolutely destroys it, while his current creature watches, watches him destroy it. So, then they have some banter back and forth, and now Frankenstein has happened upon the murder of some person, and he's been accused of that murder. So, I think we can see where this is going, but let us uh, reveal the truth as we move into... Chapter 21 of Frankenstein. I was soon introduced into the presence of the magistrate, an old benevolent man with calm and mild manners. He looked upon me, however, with some degree of severity, and then, turning towards my conductors, he asked who appeared as witnesses on this occasion. About half a dozen men came forward and one being selected by the magistrate, he deposed that he had been out fishing the night before with his son and brother-in-law, Daniel Nugent, when, about ten o'clock, they observed a strong northerly blast rising, and they accordingly put in for port. It was a very dark night, as the moon had not yet risen. They did not land at the harbour, but, as they had been accustomed, at a creek about two miles below. He walked on first, carrying a part of the fishing tackle, and his companions followed him at some distance. 
As he was proceeding along the sands, he struck his foot against something and fell at his length on the ground. His companions came up to assist him, and, by the light of their lantern, they found that he had fallen on the body of a man who was to all appearance dead. Their first supposition was that it was the corpse of some person who had been drowned and was thrown on shore by the waves, but, on examination, they found that the clothes were not wet, and even that the body was not then cold. They instantly carried it to the cottage of an old woman near the spot, and endeavoured, but in vain, to restore it to life. It appeared to be a handsome young man, about five and twenty years of age. He had apparently been strangled, for there was no sign of any violence, except the black mark of fingers on his neck. The first part of this deposition did not in the least interest me, but, when the mark of the fingers was mentioned, I remembered the murder of my brother, and felt myself extremely agitated. My limbs trembled, and a mist came over my eyes, which obliged me to lean on a chair for support. The magistrate observed me with a keen eye, and of course drew an unfavorable augury of my manner. The son confirmed his father's account. But, when Daniel Nugent was called, he swore positively that, just before the fall of his companion, he saw a boat with a single man in it, at a short distance from the shore, and, as far as he could judge by the light of a few stars, it was the same boat in which I had just landed. A woman deposed that she lived near the beach, and was standing at the door of her cottage, waiting for the return of the fisherman, about an hour before she heard of the discovery of the body, and when she saw a boat with only one man in it, push off from the part of the shore where the corpse was afterwards found. Another woman confirmed the account of the fisherman having brought the body into her house. It was not cold. They put it into a bed and rubbed it, and Daniel went to the town for an apothecary, but life was quite gone. Several other men were examined concerning my landing and they agreed that, with the strong north wind that had arisen during the night, it was very probable that I had beaten about for many hours, and had been obliged to return nearly to the same spot from which I had departed. Besides, they observed that it appeared that I had not that I had brought the body from another place, and it was likely that, as I did not appear to know the shore, I might have put into the harbour ignorant of the distance of the town from the place where I had deposited the corpse." Mr. Kerwin, on hearing this evidence, desired that I should be taken into the room where the body lay for interment, that it might be observed what effect the sight of it would produce upon me. This idea was probably suggested by the extreme agitation I had exhibited when the mode of the murder had been described. I was accordingly conducted by the magistrate and several other persons to the inn. I could not help being struck by the strange coincidences that had taken place during this eventful night. But, knowing that I had been conversing with several persons in the island I had inhabited about the time that the body had been found, I was perfectly tranquil as to the consequences of the affair. I entered the room where the corpse lay, and was led up to the coffin. How can I describe my sensations on beholding it? I feel yet parched with horror, nor can I reflect on that terrible moment without shuddering and agony. The examination, the presence of the magistrate and witnesses, passed like a dream from my memory, when I saw the lifeless form of Henry Clerval stretched before me. I gasped for breath, and, throwing myself on the body, I exclaimed, Have my murderous machinations deprived you also, my dearest Henry, of life? Two I have already destroyed, other victims await their destiny, but you, Clerval, my friend, my benefactor... The human frame could no longer support the agonies that I endured, and I was carried out of the room in strong convulsions. A fever succeeded to this. I lay for two months on the point of death. My ravings, as I afterwards heard, were frightful. I called myself the murderer of William, of Justine, and of Clerval. Sometimes I entreated my attendants to assist me in the destruction of the fiend by whom I was tormented, and at others I felt the fingers of the monster already grasping my neck, and screamed aloud with agony and terror. Fortunately, as I spoke my native language, Mr. Kerwin alone understood me, but my gestures and bitter cries were sufficient to affright the other witnesses. Why did I not die? more miserable than man ever was before, why did I not sink into forgetfulness and rest? Death snatches away many blooming children, the only hopes of their doting parents. 
how many brides and youthful lovers have been one day in the bloom of health and hope and the next a prey for worms and the decay of the tomb of what materials was i made that i could thus resist so many shocks which like the turning of the wheel continually renewed the torture but i was doomed to live and in two months found myself as awaking from a dream in a prison stretched on a wretched bed surrounded by jailers turnkeys bolts and all the miserable apparatus of a dungeon it was morning i remember when i thus awoke to understanding I had forgotten the particulars of what had happened, and only felt as if some great misfortune had suddenly overwhelmed me. But when I looked around, and saw the barred windows, and the squalidness of the room in which I was, all flashed across my memory, and I groaned bitterly. This sound disturbed an old woman who was sleeping in a chair beside me. She was a hired nurse, the wife of one of the turnkeys, and her countenance expressed all those bad qualities which often characterize that class. The lines of her face were hard and rude, like that of persons accustomed to see without sympathizing in sights of misery. Her tone expressed her entire indifference. She addressed me in English, and the voice struck me as one that I had heard during my sufferings. "'Are you better now, sir?' said she. I replied in the same language, with a feeble voice, I believe I am, but if it be all true, if indeed I did not dream, I am sorry that I am still alive to feel this misery and horror. For that matter, replied the old woman, if you mean about the gentleman you murdered, I believe that it were better for you if you were dead, for I fancy it will go hard with you. However, that's none of my business. I am sent to nurse you and get you well. I do my duty with a safe conscience, if it were well if every one did the same. I turned with loathing from the woman who could utter so unfeeling a speech to a person just saved on the very edge of death. But I felt languid and unable to reflect on all that had passed. The whole series of my life appeared to me as a dream. I sometimes doubted if indeed it were all true, for it never presented itself to my mind with the force of reality. As the images that floated before me became more distinct, I grew feverish. A darkness pressed around me. No one was near me who soothed me with the gentle voice of love. No dear hand supported me. The physician came and prescribed medicines, and the old woman prepared them for me. But utter carelessness was visible in the first, and the expression of brutality was strongly marked in the visage of the second. Who could be interested in the fate of a murderer but the hangman who would gain his fee? These were my first reflections, but I soon learned that Mr. Kerwin had shown me extreme kindness. He had caused the best room in the prison to be prepared for me. Wretched, indeed, was the best. And it was he who had provided a physician and a nurse. It is true, he seldom came to see me. For, although he ardently desired to relieve the sufferings of every human creature, he did not wish to be present at the agonies and miserable ravings of a murderer. He came, therefore, sometimes, to see that I was not neglected, but his visits were short and with long intervals. One day, while I was gradually recovering, I was seated in a chair, my eyes half open, and my cheeks livid like those in death. I was overcome by gloom and misery, and often reflected I had better seek death than desire to remain in a world which, to me, was replete with wretchedness. At one time I considered whether I should not declare myself guilty and suffer the penalty of the law, less innocent than poor Justine had been. Such were my thoughts when the door of my apartment was opened and Mr. Kerwin entered. His countenance expressed sympathy and compassion. He drew a chair close to mine, and addressed me in French. I fear that this place is very shocking to you. Can I do anything to make you more comfortable? I, I thank you, but all that you mention is nothing to me. On the whole earth there is no comfort which I am capable of receiving. I know that the sympathy of a stranger can be but of little relief to one borne down as you are by so strange a misfortune. But you will, I hope, soon quit this melancholy abode. For, doubtless, evidence can easily be brought to free you from the criminal charge. That is my least concern. I am, by a course of strange events, become the most miserable of mortals. 
Persecuted and tortured as I am, and have been, can death be any evil to me? Nothing indeed could be more unfortunate and agonizing than the strange chances that have lately occurred. You were thrown, by some surprising accident, on this shore renowned for its hospitality, seized immediately, and charged with murder. The first sight that was presented to your eyes was the, the body of your friend, murdered in so unaccountable a manner, and placed, as it were, by some fiend across your path. As Mr. Kerwin said this, notwithstanding the agitation I endured on the retrospect of my sufferings, I also felt considerable surprise at the knowledge he seemed to possess concerning me. I suppose some astonishment was exhibited in my countenance, for Mr. Kerwin hastened to say, Immediately upon your being taken ill, all the papers that were on your person were brought to me, and I examined them that I might discover some trace by which I could send to your relations an account of your misfortune and illness. I found several letters, and, among others, one which I discovered from its commencement to be from your father. I instantly wrote to Geneva. Nearly two months have elapsed since the departure of my letter. But you are ill. Even now you tremble. You are unfit for agitation of any kind. This suspense is a thousand times worse than the most horrible event. Tell me, what new scene of death has been acted, and whose murder am I now to lament? Your family is perfectly well, said Mr. Kerwin, with gentleness, and someone, a friend, is come to visit you. I know not by what chain of thought the idea presented itself, but it instantly darted into my mind that the murderer had come back to mock at my misery and taunt me with the death of Clerval as a new incitement for me to comply with his hellish desires. I put my hand before my eyes and cried out in agony, Oh, take him away! I cannot see him! For God's sake, do not let him enter! Mr. Kerwin regarded me with a troubled countenance. He could not help regarding my exclamation as a presumption of my guilt, and said, in a rather severe tone, I should have thought, young man, that the presence of your father would have been welcome, instead of inspiring such violent repugnance. My father, cried I, while every feature and every muscle was relaxed from anguish to pleasure. Uh, is my father indeed come? How kind, how, how very kind. But where is he? Why does he not hasten to me? My change of manner surprised and pleased the magistrate. Perhaps he thought that my former exclamation was a momentary return of delirium, and now he instantly resumed his former benevolence. He rose and quitted the room with my nurse, and in a moment my father entered it. Nothing at this moment could have given me greater pleasure than the arrival of my father. I stretched out my hand to him and cried, Are you then safe, and Elizabeth, and Ernest? My father calmed me with the assurances of their welfare, and endeavoured, by dwelling on these subjects so interesting to my heart, to raise my desponding spirits. But he soon felt that a prison cannot be the abode of cheerfulness. "'What a place is this that you inhabit, my son?' said he, looking mournfully at the barred windows and wretched appearance of the room. "'And you travelled to seek happiness, but a fatality seems to pursue you, and poor Clerval!' The name of my unfortunate and murdered friend was an agitation too great to be endured in my weak state. I shed tears. Alas, yes, my father, replied I, some destiny of the most horrible kind hangs over me, and I must live to fulfill it, or surely I should have died on the coffin of Henry. We were not allowed to converse for any length of time, for the precarious state of my health rendered every precaution necessary that could ensure tranquillity. Mr. Kerwin came in and insisted that my strength should not be exhausted by too much exertion. But the appearance of my father was to me like that of my good angel, and I gradually recovered my health. As my sickness quitted me, I was absorbed by a gloomy and black melancholy that nothing could dissipate. The image of Clerval was forever before me, ghastly and murdered. More than once the agitation into which these reflections threw me made my friends dread a dangerous relapse. Alas! Why did they preserve so miserable and detested a life? It was surely that I might fulfill my destiny, which is now drawing to a close. Soon, oh, very soon, will death extinguish these throbbings, and relieve me from the mighty weight of an anguish that bears me to the dust. And, in executing the award of justice, I shall also sink to rest. Then the appearance of death was distant, although the wish was ever present to my thoughts, and I often sat for hours, motionless and speechless, wishing for some mighty revolution that might bury me and my destroyer in its ruins. 
The season of the Assizes approached. I had already been three months in prison, and although I was still weak and in continual danger of a relapse, I was obliged to travel nearly a hundred miles to the county town where the court was held. Mr. Kerwin charged himself with every care of collecting witnesses and arranging my defense. I was spared the disgrace of appearing publicly as a criminal, as the case was not brought before the court that decides on life and death. The grand jury rejected the bill on its being proved that I was on the Orkney Islands at the hour of the body of my friend was found, and a fortnight after my removal I was liberated from prison. My father was enraptured on finding me freed from the vexations of a criminal charge, that I was again allowed to breathe the fresh atmosphere and permitted to return to my native country. I did not participate in these feelings, for, to me, the walls of a dungeon or a palace were alike hateful. The cup of life was poisoned for ever, and although the sun shone upon me as upon the happy and gay of heart, I saw around me nothing but a dense and frightful darkness, penetrated by no light but the glimmer of two eyes that glared upon me. Sometimes they were the expressive eyes of Henry languishing in death, the dark orbs nearly covered by the lids, and the long black lashes that fringed them. Sometimes it was the watery, clouded eyes of the monster as I first saw them in my chamber at Ingolstadt. My father tried to awaken in me the feelings of affection. He talked of Geneva, which I should soon visit, of Elizabeth and Ernest, but these words only drew deep groans from me. Sometimes, indeed, I felt a wish for happiness, and thought with melancholy delight of my beloved cousin, or longed with a devouring melody du pays to see, once more, the blue lake and rapid Rhone that had been so dear to me in early childhood. But my general state of feeling was a torpor in which prison was as welcome a residence as the divinest scene in nature and these fits were seldom interrupted but by paroxysms of anguish and despair. At these moments I often endeavored to put an end to the existence I loathed, and it required unceasing attendance and vigilance to restrain me from committing some dreadful act of violence. Yet one duty remained to me, the recollection of which finally triumphed over my selfish despair. It was necessary that I should return without delay to Geneva, there to watch over the lives of those I so fondly loved, and to lie in wait for the murderer, that, if any chance led me to the place of his conceal concealment, or if he dared again to blast me by his presence, I might, with unfailing aim, put an end to the existence of the monstrous image which I had endued with the mockery of a soul still more monstrous. My father still desired to delay our departure, fearful that I could not sustain the fatigues of a journey, for I was a shattered wreck, the shadow of a human being. My strength was gone. I was a mere skeleton, and fever, night and day, preyed upon my wasted frame. Still, as I urged our leaving Ireland with such inquietude and impatience, my father thought it best to yield. We took our passage on board a vessel, bound for Havre de Grasse, and sailed with a fair wind from the Irish shores. It was midnight. I lay on the deck, looking at the stars and listening to the dashing of the waves. I hailed the darkness that shut Ireland from my sight, and my pulse beat with a feverish joy when I reflected that I should soon see Geneva. The past appeared to me in the light of a frightful dream, yet the vessel in which I was, the wind that blew me from the detested shore of Ireland, and the sea which surrounded me, told me too forcibly that I was deceived by no vision, and that Clerval, my friend and dearest companion, had fallen a victim to me and the monster of my creation. I repassed, in my memory, my whole life, my quiet happiness while residing with my family in Geneva, the death of my mother, and my departure for Ingolstadt. I remembered, shuddering, the mad enthusiasm that hurried me on to the creation of my hideous enemy, and I called to mind the night in which he first lived. I was unable to pursue the train of thought. A thousand feelings pressed upon me, and I wept bitterly. Ever since my recovery from the fever, I had been in the custom of taking every night a small quantity of laudanum. 
for it was by means of this drug only that I was enabled to gain the rest necessary for the preservation of life. Oppressed by the recollection of my various misfortunes, I now swallowed double my usual quantity, and soon slept profoundly. But sleep did not afford me respite from thought and misery. My dreams presented a thousand objects that scared me. Towards morning, I was possessed by a kind of nightmare. I felt the fiend's grasp in my neck and could not free myself from it. Groans and cries rang in my ears. My father, who was watching over me, perceiving my restlessness, awoke me. The dashing waves were around, the cloudy sky above. The fiend was not here. A sense of security, a feeling that a truce was established between the present hour and the irresistible, disastrous future, imparted to me a kind of calm forgetfulness, of which the human mind is by its structure peculiarly susceptible. And thus we conclude chapter 21 of Frankenstein. So, another tragedy! Nothing but tragedy seems to follow in Frankenstein's wake. He was wrongfully accused of the crime of killing, well, not just anybody, but his best friend, Henry Clerval. So Clerval was found dead on the beach, strangled with those notorious black marks around his throat. Now, those are the same black marks which dawned upon the throats of, well, the throat of William, uh, Frankenstein's brother. So... That leads us to believe that, well, the creature committed the murder in his determination to make Frankenstein as wretched as he possibly can. Now, he did promise to do that upon leaving Frankenstein, when Frankenstein decided not to endow the female creature with life. So he's sort of in one of those, you know, darned if you do, darned if you don't situations where, you know, he's going to breach his own establishment of his morals, Frankenstein, that is, if he creates the creature, because he, he believes in his heart that it is the wrong thing to do. But in not doing so, he is bringing ruin upon himself, because the creature is now going to torment him, as he has been. So he is stuck. He is basically just determined or destined to live out this misery forever. Now, Frankenstein, however, we still maintain that he has some degree of egotism. I will point that out because he mentions uh, in how he was, he was considering confessing to killing Clerval before he was eventually exonerated. But before that point, he wanted to confess so that he would die, right? He was very consumed with the idea of death and thought it would be a better alternative to living through his present suffering. But he mentions that in confessing, he would be, who, who is, you know, not guilty, he thought that he was even more not guilty, even more innocent than Justine was. Now, we recall that earlier Justine had committed er, no crime at all whatsoever, but she had been framed, and she uh, confessed to doing the crime regardless, and she was killed for that. Now, she was completely innocent. Frankenstein, however, he thinks he's more innocent than she was, but he is not the least bit innocent because, well, he created the creature in the first place. He started all of this mess on his own, but he still considers himself more innocent. So, something to think about, and that gives us a lot of information about Frankenstein's character if we did not already have a pretty good picture of what he is and what he represents. But, yeah, it's... a uh, pretty deep topic to delve into. So I'll let you do the rest of the digging uh, until we meet again next week when we will read a little bit more of Frankenstein to see how his return to Geneva will fare. So until then, enjoy your weekend. Bye now.